I still see a lot of this alien eyes kind of effect. As I tweak these sliders, you can see that the image instantly starts to depart from looking realistic. You know what? The sky has actually become too saturated. It's too blue. Hey there, this video, what you'll learn from it is a response. It's an antidote to everything that's wrong with photography today. Hey, I'm Mitchell. For the past decade, I've been living my dream journeying around the world as a professional travel photographer. During this time, I've seen and I've learned a lot. And now I want to share the knowledge with you. Come along on the journey. So at present time, when it comes to photo editing, we have all these incredible tools. But what do they say? With great power comes great responsibility. And so many of us have been abusing that responsibility. What do you see a lot of when you go on Instagram or almost anywhere on social media? You see all this imagery with bright, vivid colors, more than perfect sunsets or over the top filters. And if you're just starting out, you may think that perhaps this is good photo editing, photo processing. And if you don't want to hear otherwise, then there's no need to watch this video. But if you're not satisfied with that, if you're tired of seeing all this unrealistic, over-processed, hipsterish kind of imagery, or if you find yourself caught up being influenced by it and you want help, <laughs> then this video is for you. Five tips to create realistic, lifelike photos in Lightroom. At the very least, these will help you document your family life in a way which is still impactful and atmospheric, but actually reflective of life. And if you're more ambitious and into documentary travel photography, then these tips will help you get into publications and maybe even win some awards. Tip number one, pay attention to the tone curve. I talked about just how important the tone curve is in the last video. It's my favorite tool, it's the one that I use most, but the whole thing about with great power comes great responsibility is very relevant here. What's one of the most common photo editing mistakes that people make? I used to make it quite a lot myself. We use the tone curve to create pretty crazy contrasts. The whole thing about making images punchy and dynamic, the idea is great, but where do you stop? In these photos I'm showing you, I've abused the tone curve. I'll use this photo to demonstrate what I do when I re-edit my images. I pull back the strength of the effect. Moderation is the key. Of course, there might be cases when you want that extreme look. There are exceptions to almost everything. And yes, there is a level of subjectivity too. But for most part, extreme adjustments of the tone curve are gonna look overdone. And if you are aiming to create realistic documentary type photos, this is not the way to go. Let me show you the untouched version of the photo for comparison and back to the overdone one. You see, not only is the contrast much stronger, but it's become overall more saturated and more vivid, which leads me to the next tip. I'm gonna interject real quick. The videos that I'm sharing throughout this month, they're on photo editing, photo processing, and they're part of a launch of my new educational package, which is also on photo editing. The package consists of light-based Lightroom presets and photo editing training videos. With the presets, you get about 15 years of my experience, the visual aesthetic that I've developed, in a single click. The four hours of training videos take you far beyond the presets. And there are exercises with raw files to download and to practice on. You can get this entire package at 50% off the regular price. The offer will last until January 1st. Tip number two, watch the saturation. As you've seen, only adjusting the tone curve is already enough to change the saturation or the vibrance of an image. Generally, I recommend not to even touch the saturation and the vibrance sliders before you adjust the tone curve. Also, 
this setting here, the color profile. This too plays part in how saturated and vibrant your photos will look. I'll just go through the profiles to show you. Some cameras have their own profiles and they'll create certain looks. But I'll stick to the default profiles that Lightroom has and Adobe Landscape and Adobe Vivid. They definitely increase the saturation and the vibrance more than the others. So before I get to these sliders, I'll also check how the profile I chose makes a photo look. After adjusting the tone curve and choosing a color profile like Adobe Landscape, often you'll find that you don't need to increase the value in the saturation and the vibrance sliders. It's already been increased. Just have a look at this photo before the adjustments and the profile change and after. I did not adjust the saturation or the vibrance here. Here I've adjusted the tone curve, I've made some more basic adjustments, and I chose the Adobe Landscape color profile. The overall feeling of the image is great. I definitely wanted more color here. It is now more reflective of how the scene was, but you know what? The sky has actually become too saturated. It's too blue. This is something that is pretty common when you make the adjustments that I mentioned. So rather than increase the saturation, I need to decrease it here. And I'm going to do that, but I'm going to adjust an individual color. I'll go to the blues and decrease this value here. With just this slight tweak, I feel more at peace with the sky not looking like it's from another planet. So yeah, a very common little adjustment to always look out for. Tip number three. Don't overdo the eyes. Many photo editing mistakes often come back to the fact that we've overdone the tone curve. Like here, I tweaked the curve too much. The photo looks very contrasty and the eyes have become too dark. So when this happens, we immediately want to compensate and to brighten the eyes. But you might end up with something like this. I still see a lot of this alien eyes kind of effect. And someone who's pretty illiterate photographically might even compliment you and say, look, those eyes, so powerful. But anyone who understands will say, damn, you really overdid this one. Here's the version of the same image where the curve is less extreme. And adjusting the curve in a more conservative manner gets rid of a lot of the need to adjust the eyes. But I still see a lot of this. And I don't know why so many of us overprocess the eyes. Maybe it's the whole idea of the eyes being windows to the soul and we try too hard. Or maybe we want to make sure that we communicate the impact that a person's eyes had on us and we get carried away. For me, there are two main rules when editing the eyes. I always try to brighten only the darker parts of the eye, like around here. The white parts very rarely need to be brightened. So here there's a radial filter over the eye, but it's over the entire eye. That's why if I compare this photo to the untouched one, you see the bright part of the eye got even brighter. What I'll do is go to Range Mask, choose Luminance, Show Luminance Mask, and I'll select only the darker range of tones within the eye. This is a step in the right direction. Still a little too bright though, and here's where the second rule comes in. Whenever you adjust the eyes, have a look at what you've done, give yourself a moment, and then dial back the adjustment. I'll turn off the effect for a second. This is without the adjustment to the eye, and this is with. And now it is very subtle, but that's fine. Trust me, experience has taught me that subtlety is much better than going overboard and you'll have much less desire to re-edit your images when you're more subtle. Tip number four, avoid tweaking the sliders in split toning. Most of the time, if you want realistic looking results, unless you know what you're doing, you don't need to touch these sliders under split toning. 
in my presets, I do adjust the highlights for many of them, but that's just to give the images that little extra sense of mood. I also have very specific goals in mind when I do this, and I do have enough experience to do this pretty well. If you're just starting out, or if you're not so confident, don't bother too much with these. And definitely don't tweak these ones under shadows. As I tweak these sliders, you can see that the image instantly starts to depart from looking realistic. Now, the reason why I mention these settings is because adjusting the shadows under split toning seems to be all the rage these days. Uh, it's used as an effect in many presets, in Instagram filters, and yeah, it's true, uh, making these adjustments will give your images a certain feel, a certain style, but at the end of the day, my question is always, why? Of course, there are some uses for such kinds of adjustments, but in general, for travel and documentary photography, it's nothing more than a trend. Uh, it's a gimmick, something that you'll look at months later and ask yourself, what was I thinking? Just because you see so much of it, doesn't mean that you have to do it too. Tip number five, make references for when you're editing. When I'm out shooting, I make mental notes about how something felt when I was there, or about how a photo should feel. That's what I mean by references. Should a scene feel cool, warm, dark, bright? My memory is pretty good, but the key is that I usually process the photos the day of the shoot, so there's really not that much time to forget. If you are processing later, Make those same notes in a notebook in Evernote or make them as sound recordings on your phone. A note could go something like, the scene in the photo of the house at dawn felt very cool and mysterious. Or that with the boy and the cows, there was a feeling of overwhelming brightness and all the colors looked a little bleached from the sun. The way that a scene feels might be totally obvious to you when you're actually there, but when you shoot hundreds of images and move from place to place, it's very easy to get mixed up or to forget. If you have made those references, it won't matter if you edit your photos days later. You'll still be able to process them in a way that'll reflect the notes, and most importantly, in a way that'll reflect the way that you felt. Before I go, here's one bonus tip. Surround yourself with the right visual influences. By right, in this case, I mean documentary, real life imagery that is respected and accepted as actually being lifelike. So right away, Nat Geo comes to mind. I feel like the website Lens Culture has really solid work to look at as well. The Magnum Photos website is an absolute goldmine. You could say that a lot of the work there, especially the older film stuff, can be seen as quite stylized but it's stylized within the realm of reality. So if you do want to get really more advanced in an independent way, there are so many good ideas to get from there. It's a great way to get a feel for how far is not too far when it comes to image editing. Now, just as I encourage you to look at certain work, I want to discourage you from looking at certain Instagram accounts, at certain social media stars, if you think, if you feel that their work is over the top, overdone, most likely it is. And when you look at a certain kind of work a lot, uh, it kind of imprints itself onto you. You start to become influenced by it, whether you realize it or not. And if you are looking at a lot of mediocre work, then in a sense, you're polluting your mind, your vision. If you start emulating the fads, the gimmicks, you are heading down a particular kind of path. And initially you may be very excited about it, you may want that, but as with all shallow and gimmicky things, you really get over it after some time. That's all for another set of tips on photo editing in Lightroom. Remember the launch and the special offer on my light-based presets and photo editing training videos is still on. Save 50%. Don't just sit around dreaming about traveling. Improve something in your photography that you do have control over. Next week's video will be a very special one. We'll edit one of my photos using one of my presets. You'll have the files and all of the info next week. Okay, that's it. Getting dark here, so goodbye for now.